I'd like to simply ask the question, where do sermons come from? Last uh, talk, we kind of worked conceptually through how um, arcs work and tension and perhaps a schematic overview of how things work. And we touched on some memorization type things, but that then, of course, raises a whole series of questions. Last night presupposed that there was some content to work with. Uh, so in some senses, last night had a certain sort of uh, how are things arranged, which is lovely, but there's a key word, things. Um, so uh, that's what I'd like to work with. Now, i uh, give you an overview of where we're headed in this next little bit. Um, I want to talk about radar, buckets, chunks, and marinade. Now, I know you all know about this, and you've heard this a thousand times, so I'll just give you my spin on the classic radars, buckets, chunks, and marinade out there, a lot of preachers talking about it, but this is my version. Uh, this language might not be helpful for you. May, perhaps you have your own. So once again, as with anything else we're doing here, just trying to share some things I've observed and hopefully perhaps you can extract from it some um, meaning for your own context. So every preacher has faced at one time or another the existential horror and trauma of the blank screen. Sunday is coming and your computer screen is blank. Your notebook is blank and we need to fill that and we have to do it, Lord, in the next couple of days. <laughs> Are you with me? This is what I want to work through in, the next, in this session. How to get to the place where when you sit down to work, you're not starting with a blank screen. Makes sense. What if you could get to the place where every time you were consciously, intentionally working on a teaching, you were not starting with a blank screen? And so what I have learned is that there are certain disciplines now immediately when you start talking about this, people are like, okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. If we're talking now about 40 hours a week studying, I can't do that because of the realities of all sorts of things. I am not, I mean, I'm gonna keep saying this, I am not arguing for, um, you just need to be in your study 40 hours a week and the church just needs to leave you alone so you can get the study. I'm not, that would be boring and that's not something that any of us are, that doesn't even really work, I don't think. So I'm talking about something else. There is having to say something, and then there is having something to say, and they are two very different things. And my experience has been that Sundays keep coming, and so what can happen is a bunch of other things take your time and energy, and all of a the sudden, there is a thing coming, and it is 14, 11, 7, three days away, and I have to have something to say on that day, which is a very different thing than, okay, I've got something to say, and Sunday can't come fast enough. And so my goal here is simply, are there some everyday sort of disciplines, postures, and ways of seeing the world that I can move to the place, what would it be like if every time you got up to teach, you had something to share and it was like, I can't wait to share this. What would that be like? How many of you have lived in both of these at one time or another? You know both of these very well. Um, how many of you several days out know which of these two it's gonna be. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and, and I want to also dispel, there are some who are like, no, no, I do my best work under pressure on Saturday nights. Um, you are sick and you need help. <laughs> there are others who are like, wait, 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 what are you talking, you know, man, I just let the spirit move. I just wanna, I, I just, in, I'm just in the moment. What if you gave the spirit six months to move instead of 14 hours? I want to move you from thinking about, from thinking, I want to open you up to 
sermon preparation is all around us, all the time, everywhere, everybody, versus Tuesday at nine. <laughs> I want to, to help maybe begin, um, and for some of you guys, assume you're way, way down the road here. What happens sometimes is there's all of life going on all around, and then it's generally, I sit down at Tuesdays at nine and work on the sermon. And that's great, keep Tuesdays at nine, or Thursdays at four, or Monday morning, or however you do that, great. But what if there was something else going on all the time, and so that when you did have those moments when you were all alone and you had it blocked out, and people knew you were at the coffee shop six miles away and they couldn't get a hold of you, and you sat down, what if that wasn't your ground zero starting point, but what, about, what if a bunch of stuff was already swirling, and in those moments you were just kind of harnessing, arranging, and see what happened to be dancing with the most fluidity today? Does that make sense? So. Genesis 28, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. To begin with, God wants to give you radar to see the Lord who is in this place. I just wasn't aware of it until now. If you believe that the earth is God's and everything in it, if you believe that God spoke it all into existence and continues to speak it all in a sort of way into existence, then God is in this place. And faith is expanding consciousness. The life of the kingdom, it's upon you, it's among you, it's, a, it's around you, it's come, it's arrived, it's here, it's been inaugurated. Faith is growing, expanding consciousness to see that the Lord is in this place. Faith is waking up to the God who's been here all along. I've just been sleeping. So I begin with the fundamental premise that wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, whoever I'm interacting with, Lord's in this place. And I am in some way going to be in this encounter, in this experience, in this moment, I am going to be invited to wake up and see a Lord who's in this place. I, I just wasn't aware of it until this moment. Some of the language, man, it was awesome. And then, I mean, we're just going like, and then God showed up. Actually, <laughs> I think God was there the whole time. I think somebody showed up, but it wasn't God. <laughs> Jesus wants to teach you how to show up. He's already there. In John 5, Jesus put it this way, my father is always at work to this very day. So Jesus' consciousness was deeply grounded in an assumption that his heavenly father was at work right now. Something's going down. Wind is blowing. Really clear metaphor there. What's the spirit like? It's like a wind, you don't really know where it comes from, where it's going. Build a theology around that. <laughs> so, so I begin with the preacher has radar, finely tuned to the presence and the movement, work, and activity of the living God whose spirit blows where it wants. One of the reasons we keep using the word art is an artist is hypersensitive to the world around them. One of the tasks of the teacher, the preacher, the speaker, the sermonizer is to be hypersensitive to the world around them. You pick up things, perhaps, that others haven't, and then you point it out to them. You put words on it. You tell stories about it, and people say, oh, you make connections. Oh, yes, that's it, that's it. Oh, thank you. Oftentimes what you're doing is simply pointing out what's been there the whole time. They just haven't seen it, and perhaps you were given the gift of waking up, and now you're helping others perhaps wake up. So I begin with this premise that uh, the earth is humming, that life is like 
preaching to me all the time. So I am not surprised when I'm in some odd situation, in some conversation that I never could have cooked up in, in my weirdest imagination, I am not surprised when there are moments of, oh man, that's awesome, that's brilliant. A friend of mine, this great theologian, always says, you know what God's other name is? And I'm thinking, uh, Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh, he's like, you know what God's other name is? Surprise. Surprise. Now, this has uh, a couple of ways to approach this. Next. So let's do this. First of your notes, I want to first talk about life, and then I want to talk about the biblical text. Those of you who are like, okay, what's the, what's the, give me a little bit of stuff to get handles on here. If I encounter something that strikes me in some way, I write it down. Something that grabs me, something that jumps out, something that grabs me by the neck and says, I am something. You don't know what right now, but I am something. Um, I take a picture of it. My phone has a, a camera on it. I see something, I see a billboard that makes me laugh. I pull over and I take a picture of it. I uh, have a moment in the woods and something strikes me about that moment, I take a picture of it. I save it, I ask for it. I'm at the store and they have a thing behind the counter and it's this, and it's like, it's the epitome of something that, can I, can I have that? You wouldn't be, you'd be amazed how many people just give you stuff if you ask for it. I give it, and, and stay, I get it, I clip it, I tear it out, I store it. Somebody mentioned to me the other day in an article I was reading, the writer referenced a study done in a British biology magazine. I clipped the article, but then I made a note, find that study. Because the reference made was like, whoa, very interesting what that is. Um, store it, mark it, remember it, and here's the key, with no edit button. You don't know why. You don't know what it means. You don't know where it's gonna fit in the sermon. You, you don't know any of that. And for so many people, they have so many layers of filters that no wonder then it's hard to tap into that explosive, energetic, dynamic creativity that just kind of unleashes on people. It's, there's so many layers built up, it can't even come in. How's it ever gonna come out? Does that make sense? So part of it is just, I don't know, I had this conversation with somebody and they had this phrase they use to describe how they think, see their kids and they used this phrase and it was really like, it was so weird and yet it was a perfect description of what it's like to try and get a three-year-old to behave. And so write it down, write it down. You don't know when 18 months from now you will be working on something and all of a sudden you realize, you know what goes here in this teaching? The story about my friend and the thing he said. Does that make sense? Now, just capture it. I call, uh, so, so I have, uh, whether you do a file or whether you just have a room somewhere in your life, um, it's a storage room at the church, it's a shelf in your basement, you've just got stuff. I've, uh, I've got mannequin heads, I've got disco balls, um, stuffed animals, like stuffed, not like kid stuffed animals, like, like a taxidermy, I mean, you, you name it. Right now, I just noticed going in from the garage into our kitchen on the shelf is the jawbone of a donkey from a sermon a couple of weeks ago that when I used the jawbone of a donkey, somebody said, well, man, I'm doing a teaching in a week. Can I borrow the jo your donkey jawbone? I was like, no, borrow someone else's. <laughs> Don't you have your own? What in the world? Get your donkey jawbone supplier, get your own. Um, no edit button. You don't know why. You don't know why you saved that article. There was a line in it that struck you, so you clipped it. I don't know if it'll ever come back around. I don't know what it means right now. I know that it grabbed me. So part of it is becoming deeply attuned. Certain things grab you. 
And often what happens is they grabbed you, perhaps at a subconscious level, maybe they were like, I'm interesting, trust me, I'm very interesting. Capture it. Because later you might be thinking, I would love to have an example of what such and such, I would love to have an example of this. And you remember, oh wait, 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 there was this writer that mentioned this study and you go and find the study and now you're looking for an example and actually you stumbled upon actual statistics to back up a gut instinct you had just from reading this passage. So all of a sudden, boom, 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 Boom. Are we tracking? So whatever filing system you have, whatever uh, way that you do this, whatever, uh, however you capture this stuff, just capture it. Just capture it. When you are working with a specific text, uh, sometimes the most powerful thing you can do is just memorize it. I mean, it's kind of a duh, but... I've, met, I've talked to pastors who've been staring at a screen trying to work on us. I've been working on the sermon forever. I've been trying to make it happen. I've been trying to make it work. Have you memorized the passage? No. Well, do something. It's amazing. Let's say, let's, let's begin with this, that you're starting with a, with a text that is agreed upon. Either you're doing a series or an assigned text. And so let's right now begin with the text isn't you're looking for text, you have a central text. If I come to a text fresh, one of the first things I would probably do, or even a key line, is just, just, mem just memorize it first. What happens when you memorize it also, and this is key, is then you're out for a run, taking a walk, and instead of having to be with the physical scripture to be working on the sermon, the text is now just kind of working through your mind and heart and subconscious. It's now just kind of with you. Does that make sense? You would not believe the number of things that happen just when you're carrying the text around with you. Also, what's interesting when you memorize is memorizing uh, certain things will start to stand out. The scripture is not just a static duh, 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 duh. When you memorize it, certain words, even as you say them, will trigger things. Just memorizing it. What have other people said about this text? I just inhale. I want to tap into the discussion that has been going on for thousands of years about this text. I want to know kind of the spectrum on how people have understood it. So in the beginning, I'm just accumulating. I'm just inhaling. For me, are there key words here? What are the key words, and is there anything else going on? Do the words have pictures behind them? So uh, the word for temptation, is it a fishing term, which refers to the way in which you lure? Okay, whoa, there's like a whole picture there. I have often, in looking through the words, found a picture. The word is actually, in Greek, means this and this, and realize, oh my word, that, that a whole teaching begins to sprout just from what this one word means. Somebody recently, a, a rabbi, was telling me that the Hebrew word for forgive shares the same root word as the word to dance. And I thought, okay, okay, by the way, write it down. Remember that when a rabbi says that the word forgive and the word dance share the same root, you can't dance if you haven't forgiven. Um, so that's just like, that's just floating out there. But somebody, a rabbi hands you a nugget, take it, put it in your pocket, and go home and store it. <laughs> now, uh, words, uh, location, where does this take place? Does anything else take place here? Um, uh, let me think of uh, Zacchaeus lives in Jericho. He lives in Jericho, and apparently he has things that belong to other people, and he says, if I've taken anything from anybody, I'll give back. Wow, and isn't Jericho, what else happened in Jericho? Wasn't, wasn't it Achan's sin, a guy who had some sacred things and he had to give them back or something? Whoa, 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 is the Jericho story. What else happens in Jericho? What else happens in Jericho? Uh, where does this happen again? This happens in the north? Well, what happens in the north? Is there a map? Is there anything else that happens there? What's the location of this? What's the location? It happened at Bethel. What else happened at Bethel? Um, even just a basic, it happened where? Open the concordance. Um, Herod kills Jesus outside of Bethlehem, which was where Rachel's tomb was. And wasn't Rachel's tomb the place Jeremiah mentioned as the place representing barrenness? So apparently was there a shrine there about the barrenness of Israel? And does Herod actually kill the babies there as a way of saying, hey, 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 look who has the power? Location. 
Who knows what's gonna pop just from location? Even like a really basic look up the location in a concordance and then read the other places that mention that location. You can even start there, let alone all of the other scholarly, archeological, whatever resources. Location, culture, are there concepts here? Paul is talking about what? Recapitulation? Does he mention this anywhere else? He's talking about what? He's talking about a grace, but it's a grace that comes through suffering. Well, does he mention this anywhere else? Is this a pattern? Is this a story? Are there other stories like this? Does this writer tell other stories? And do the stories connect? What are the similarities? What are the differences? Is this a Jesus story? Well, if this is a Jesus story, are there other Jesus stories in other gospels? Is this story told multiple times? And are there details in the other story that aren't in this one? Or does this one include details the others don't? Why does Luke mention certain details the other don't? Well, in the other stories that are the same, does Luke add details? And if so, what is Luke trying to say? Why does John keep numbering the signs that Jesus performs. Why does he say this was his second sign? Well, if he says this was his first sign, this was his second sign, then I ought to probably start looking for the, if there's a third sign, is there a fourth? Is there, wait, I can count seven. And then after seven, he rises from the dead and she mistakes him for a gardener. Whoa, John, Juan, what are you up to? <laughs> just. Wow, these stories have a pattern to them. Um, Oh, oh, and this one, this will unleash things. What time period did this happen in? What else was going on? What else was going on? Wait, 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 wait. Are you telling me that the Philistines and Israel and around the time of David was the Bronze Age? Wait, wait, wait. Was that a period in human history when we have the first bronze weapons? Now, if you've got a wood stick and he's got a bronze spear, you're in trouble. If the nation next door has bronze spears and you all still have like bow and arrows and Nerf guns, (laughs) whoa. So when it says that the Israelites were having to go down to the Philistines because the Philistines could make weapons, what's going on here? There's a new technology on the scene and the Philistines are on the cutting edge of it and the Israelites don't have it. Wow. So then a kid with a stone, well, there's a whole, there's a whole, moment in human history involving technology. The Tower of Babel begins when someone invents a brick. Well, wait, why does the text mention that? Well, before bricks, you made things with stones. Have you ever tried to build a wall with round stones that are unevenly sized? It takes a while. Have you ever tried to build something uniform and assembly line-like with all sorts of different size shaped rocks. It's very, very hard to do, but somebody invented a brick. Well, a brick you could make uniform size. You can stack those things pretty high, pretty fast. The brick is like the microchip of the ancient world. So the story of Babel has right underneath the surface this major moment in human history when a new technology came into being. And the story of Babel then becomes there was this new technology and they used this new technology and saw it as a way to make themselves like gods. Interesting. So the Tower of Babel has this backstory, which is, is our technology going to be used to increase shalom within the harmony of hierarchy with our creator or will this new technology give us an inflated sense of our own godness? But that's about then. <laughs> um, pictures. Jesus is coming up over the Mount of Olives into the city and he curses a fig tree. I mean, for a lot of people, this is the Mount of Olives. You can see Jerusalem in the background. Just a picture of, oh, wait, wait, wait. Th- this story, th- This is an actual physical place and I can see a picture of it. Um, Pictures, actions, is there anything going on in this text? Does anybody do anything? 
Um, a couple weeks ago, I was talking about forgiveness and the parable of the unmerciful servant. So I got these, this group of improv actors together, and we had a king and an unmerciful servant, and then another servant who owes him, and then we had two servants, and then we had two guards, and just kind of um, the power of the story is, it's like, wait, wait, let's just have them kind of act it out, and then we act it out forward, act it out backwards, act it out faster, act it out slower, um, and each time they would like go through it, I'd interrupt them and move in among them, and notice this, notice this, notice this, the debt, what's the debt here? What's the debt, how does it work? What does the king do with his ledger? What does the king, and so just interacting with that, just asking, does this scripture just need to be done for people? What would happen if there's an action involved, if we just actually had people see what we're reading? What things would emerge just by moving it to 3D? And um, then obviously, you're probably picking this theme up, are there connections with this text? Does this help? Uh, let's do this. Does somebody in here have a Bible somewhere in here? Uh, yes, could you just open up your Bible randomly? Close your eyes, open it up, read me, not to Hezekiah. <laughs> okay, great, great, okay, just read me a verse. What book, what chapter, what verse? Wisdom has built her house, she has hewn out seven pillars. Uh, what's the Hebrew word for wisdom? Where does it come from? Where else is it used? Where is, what is the Greek word? When later the Hebrew concept of wisdom was translated into Greek, what is the Greek word for wisdom and are there connections? Does Jesus mention wisdom? And if he does, does he borrow from any of the Hebrew tradition? When it says wisdom her, wisdom is personified as a female. Now is that chapters one through eight or are there other pictures of that throughout the Hebrew scriptures? Is there a tradition surrounding the wisdom? Is there anything involving a house? And how many pillars was it? Seven. Seven. So is this a particular style of architecture? And does this particular style of architecture always involve the number seven? And what were the pillars for? And were pillars used as a symbol or a euphemism for anything else? I mean, was a pillar a way of speaking of something? And so would the early person have been like, oh, was this like a Home Depot metaphor? Where everybody was like, oh, you're saying that wisdom is like a and we're missing a whole thing there. Are there pictures from this particular time period of what um, remains of what, or artist rendering of what a house might have looked like? Is there anything about the feminine personification of wisdom that tells me something about the nature of God? I don't know, I don't, I'm just, I mean, I'm just like, like right there, it's just like, oh my word, I have a lot of work to do. But the one thing that isn't is a blank screen. At least now I got some work to do, so I'm not staring at a blank screen. Now, I may have to go down a whole bunch of dead ends, but at least I'm not staring at a blank screen. If nothing else, you have seven minutes of content telling the congregation all the things that passage isn't. Um, and then, of course, is there all sorts of um, other, I mean, what have other people said about this? Or this one, let's move it to a different level. Um, in Proverbs 1 through 8, wisdom calls out. So instantly, instantly, I, there, there's like, she's a woman, and she's saying, over here, over here. But there's also another woman, and she's saying, over here. Over here, good looking. <laughs> so, so instantly, do you have two different voices? And there are these two calls, the way of the world and the way of the wisdom of God. And what the Proverbs keeps doing is keeps showing you these two voices are always calling to you. And here's how the one works. Notice what she says, see how she works? She appeals to this. She masquerades as this, she promises you this, but she can't deliver. The other one, she speaks like this. She looks like this. And all of a sudden now, by the way, I'm just making this all up on the spot, but what you have essentially is you begin to have a sort of like, oh wow, this thing is starting to, but can I use that by the way? <laughs> oh wait, I have tons more, I just realized. Next slide. <laughs> Couple of questions you can ask. If I couldn't use any biblical or religious language, how would I describe this? To a child, to a Martian, how would I describe this without words? 
using only drawings and pictures, using only actors, or acting. So I can immediately, there are a couple of questions I can ask that may help me get, okay, I'm trying to explain this thing and I'm having trouble getting that one sentence that crystallizes it so I don't keep circling the runway and not being able to land. Now, if I were explaining this to a child, how would I do it? I would talk, I would say it this way. You wouldn't believe how many things can, can get crystallized simply by asking, how does a nine-year-old hear this? How do I explain this to a nine-year-old? Uh, to somebody who had just landed from outer space, if it's Christian, then it's going to be fully human. Does that make sense? If it's Christian, it's going to be the best possible news and information about what it means to be human. Because Jesus is about the new humanity, as Paul says it. So I'm inviting you to be a Christian or to see the world with a Jesus perspective. I'm not inviting you to something other than being fully human, living in God's world. So let's think about this in terms of, is this the best, po well first off you have to decide if you believe that. And then, uh, how would I describe this to my friend who has said to me, don't give me any of your religious stuff. How would I describe this? How would I describe this? How would I put language to it? Um, using only drawings, if I only had sketches, how would I do this? Um, if I had to describe the mysterious way in which a sermon can meet all of these different people at all these different places and yet invite each person to the next step, how would I do it? I'd probably just do a big arrow with an A and a B and a C, I don't know. But if I, what is the core thing here? So like the, the hard, hard work of figuring out how do I distill that, how do I, or if I just had people doing stuff, could I describe this? So uh, there's uh, one place where the scripture speaks of stumbling. So the word in, in, the word in Greek literally means like, like that. So there, boom, just, just with no props or nothing, just this word means this. Okay, so I've just moved something from the text to flesh and blood 3D. Interesting, that may come in handy. There's actually a place on our stage at Mars Hill where for some unknown reason, the stage is, there's one section that's like two inches higher than another section. And probably for about seven years, every time I walked on that section, I would trip. After a while, you're like, can I just not trip in front of all these people every time it happens? And then there came this day when I stumbled upon that word in the sermon for that week and I got to reference all of the years that I had tripped on that place in the stage because I meant to do that to make my point seven years later. <laughs> Don't call it a comeback. Now, um, next slide. A Couple other questions that come to mind. What's the thing behind the thing here? What's the mystery behind the mystery? What's the truth behind the truth? We're talking about tithing. Well, we're talking about tithing. Well, what's the thing behind the thing here? Generosity or participation or making your life about more than yourself or about how deeply our pocketbooks are connected with our hearts? So what's the thing? What's the mystery behind the mystery? What's the truth behind the truth? What, uh, this, here's an example. You drive by a church and out front it says five week series on what makes a biblical marriage. That is great for the people who are married or who want to be married. What is the sign just said to a significant percentage of our population? For the next five weeks we're not talking about you. Now, here's the mystery. Here is the art form. What are you about to say on marriage? And what's the thing behind the thing? 
and what are the truths about what make a great marriage? Oh, well, communication. Wait, wait, what's communication? Communication is about being deeply connected with what's really happening inside of you. It's about respect. It's about holding your tongue. Are we talking about marriage now? What else are we talking about? All of life. Now, instead of doing a sermon on good communication and marriage, what if you got to the thing behind the thing, the truth behind the truth, and you could get at patience, holding your tongue, being so deeply connected with your insides that you understand what's going on so that you are able to connect with another? What if you did it in such a way that everybody who is married was like, oh my word, this is like brilliant advice for our marriage. See, what happens is people stay here, and then it stays a certain, we're talking about tithing. But what if it was, I want to talk to you about a Trinitarian view of the universe, in which there's an endless circle of self-giving love and sacrifice, in which it is not a depravity scarcity view, it is a bountiful, plentiful view of the universe, in which you step into this endless Trinitarian circle of love and giving, and you give whatever you've got, and it comes back around to you, but you're not keeping score because you're caught up in something in which we're no longer wondering, what'd you do for me, what'd you do for her? It's just, look what I get to do, and somebody received something from that, brilliant, and I received all that, what a gift. Whew. What if you do that, and then at the end, now, for a few moments, as we begin to think about a Trinitarian view of the universe, a couple things that immediately step to mind is, I think this has, maybe has something to do with tithing. Maybe it also probably has something to do with this. Maybe for you, you're hearing this and going, has something to do with brilliant. And so you have given people some places to start. You have started a discussion. You've opened the thing up, but you've actually said some stuff at the same time. So you've said a bunch of stuff, but you've also created a place where people can go, oh my word, that's, whew. Yeah? So that's, for me, very, very, what's the thing behind the thing? What's the mystery behind the mystery? What's the truth behind the truth? So there's this mysterious vision John gives us of a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. But you just extract one thing about that, the psychological power of worship. Maybe you call up a psychologist you know. Um, talk to me about what happens when people become self-absorbed, when, when people see themselves at the center of everything. Oh, well, let me give you just about five minutes on narcissism. Let me give you five minutes on this thing I've seen. What are you, now, you're not going, I like to talk about narcissism now, but you do all of a sudden have a bunch of stuff. Interesting, very, very interesting. So there, there is psychological value in worship. I haven't heard that before. Oh yeah, well if it's true, then it's true, period. If it's true, then why are we surprised that this discipline and this science and this field of study and this work all witness to it? It's God's world. We get to live in it, all things are yours. Uh, oh, but we're just getting warmed up. Next, what else we got here? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there any way to enact it, perform it? Is there any way to show it? Is there any way to do it? Is there any way to ignore it? Should I, at the beginning of the sermon, put on a big orange jacket and then just start in and make no reference to the orange jacket? <laughs> What's every person in the place doing? What's the deal with the orange jacket? You just bought yourself like 40 minutes right there, okay? <laughs> Whatever you do, don't go, check out this prop I'm doing. Pretty sweet. No, 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 no. Sometimes it's just that's, apparently at some point we're gonna deal with the pig. <laughs> Don't know when, but apparently we're headed somewhere. Remember what my editor friend said, I can take off my editor's hat because I realize that I'm in good hands. We're headed somewhere. Something's gonna unfold. I'm gonna be taken somewhere. Somebody has done some work here and they're gonna bring it. All right, I'm ready. And you got me interested, because I'm wondering how are you gonna, and especially if you started in Jude, and you've got like a dog on stage, now I'm really listening. Because you're gonna try to get from there to there. Um, circle around it, 
hand it out. I convinced the owner of a local nursery to give me a piece of myrrh for every person in the church for a Christmas sermon. So when they came in, they'd be handed myrrh. But you don't know what myrrh is when you first see it. You're just like, I think that might be gross. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, were you cleaning the cage earlier? <laughs> You have people in your congregations who could think of no higher honor than taking their unique skills, talents, passions, and resources and converting them into helping you make a point. You meet somebody in your congregation who says, I'm a blah, 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 blah. remember that, get a name and license plate number. I met years ago somebody in our congregation who has a gardening show on the radio. He's, so, he's this really great guy. And on the, he goes on the radio and he calls himself Phil Dirt. <laughs> and he does call-in questions on gardening. And it's, he ab, he's, he's crazy about gardening. He's like a gardening legend in the world where there are gardening legends. So I'm doing Song of Songs uh, years ago, and it strikes me one day that there is a reference in this verse to plants. And I was like, wait, wait, are there other, are there other plants? Because generally, you know, you read plants in the Bible, you're like, okay, it's a plant. I was like, are there other references? And I came up with this, just read through it quickly, and I was like, wait, wait, there's a bunch of plants here. I call him. Can you tell me about the plants in Song of Songs? I get, no, no, he writes me without me calling. He writes me a letter. I've been sitting there, I heard a couple weeks of Song of Songs. Did you know that the whatever plant has these properties, these qualities? Do you realize what this says about the verse? Do you realize that this plant is actually poisonous unless you know how to use it properly, kind of like sex? So I was like, wait, 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 okay, okay, fill dirt, here's the situation. <laughs> Can you get me those plants? And this is what you're going to hear. I'd be honored. So we did a Sunday where we filled, he, I came in that Sunday, I was like, oh, oh my word. Oh, all those super allergic people in your church who like <laughs> at Easter are like, why didn't you do silk flowers? Okay, just stay home and save your emails because it's going down. Um, <laughs> He had filled the stage with plants. And literally all I did was sit on a stool and we had, it was towards the end of the series, people we'd already been working through these passages, just read a passage. And he'd be like, oh, oh my word, okay, check this out. And I, he'd, take a Sunday off. <laughs> I mean, I just literally read these, and he just went. And it was like, Phew and the images, and the metaphors, and the truths. Um, you have people, there was a guy in our church who, who played for the, um, his dream in life was to play Dallas, for the Dallas Cowboys for Tom Landry, and he played for like a couple of days and then blew out his knee, but he played. And he's just giant and strong, and um, he has been a Roman guard, I think three times, he has worn a short skirt for me <laughs> three different times in the past year. He take, okay, I want you to come up, and that unmerciful servant, he goes, take him and take him away. You got it, boss. You got it, I'm there. <laughs> it's so great. Like we did it two weeks ago. He, and and um, the guy who played for the, for the Dallas uh, Cowboys, the other, his friend, and they're my two Roman guards, his friend's name, true story, is Tom Brady. So <laughs> these two are like, I think they've been on stage three times in the past year and a half, whenever I need giant Roman guards, I'm your man, and they show up and I get to say again, it's always good to see you in a skirt. Um, <laughs> it's this beautiful bond between us. When you meet somebody who has something, when you meet somebody who has a skill, when you meet somebody who says, oh yeah, I got an ant farm. <laughs> Write it down. <laughs> Actually, I just made that up on the spot and then realized, doesn't Solomon say something about ants? Just saying. Connections, connections, <laughs> connections. <laughs> Can you see what happens when a preacher sits down in front of a blank screen 
reads the text, and then reads a couple of commentaries, and then sits there. Man, that's death. You get this big, beautiful world. You got all these people with experiences and skills. You got, I mean, and you've been handed this thousand page mysterious strange exotic book that's got every sort of story and verse and poem and it's got narrative and it's got deep profound philosophical and it's quotes from the ancient world and it speaks to transitions in human history and it's I mean it's like come on do I have more I I swear that there's more on oh yeah 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 (laughs) there's like tons more Uh, I'm just gonna keep going because I'm having a good time I don't know about you so um Radar. Now, what I do in the, when, when something strikes me is I make a bucket of it. I hear that thing about dance and forgive, and I just open up a new um, w- document on my computer, and I just make a bucket. I might even just type in, the bucket might be called dance slash forgive, and in the top of the page, I might just type um, that guy who told me that the root word, that dance and forgive share the same root word. That's all I got, but once again, I don't have my what button on. Edit button. I don't even know if it's true. All I know is I heard it. I'll back it up later. I'll research it later. I'll hunt it down later. I'll look for its verification later. All I know is it struck me, and I want to capture it. Now, maybe you don't do this on a computer screen. Maybe you do this with three by five cards. Um, but I don't know what form things are best for you to capture. And maybe you're working with a script kind of sermon that you do, wonderful. Maybe you're working with a uh, more organized outline. The sketch that I showed you last night of like the opening nights thing, there were actually subpoints beneath each of those. And so generally I work in a Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, Roman numeral three, subpoint A, B, C. So obviously when you saw that, you realized that the dearly beloved was the intro and then the first point was the evaluate, endure, The Endure, Evaluate, Propaganda, um, that section was section Roman numeral two, section um, A, B, C, D, and then under that were subpoints one, two, and then sub-subpoints were A, B. So I I do that so I know the whole kind of schematic structure of the thing well, and then from there you can always do higher altitude notes. So um, buckets, I just get all these buckets going. I just capture it, just capture it. Imagine if once a week you captured something like, man, that's, think about this. A year from now, you would have 50 or more things that struck you as interesting. I mean, I'm not talking, once again, about you in an office 40 hours a week. And when you hear, like, teaching pastor and all that, and you think, you know, an idealized sort of, if I could just, if I could just be free to, to study all the time, um, I'm not talking about that, ooh, all alone, kind of close. I'm talking about three minutes here, three minutes there. We have yet to talk about anything that takes longer than five minutes. Even when he read Proverbs uh, in a minute, we had a bunch of stuff to work on. That was two minutes of work right there. Um, we are not talking. At some point, perhaps, there will be hours and hours of work, but let's, um, let's, let's right now, all we are talking about is everyday sorts of disciplines. I see the world a particular way, and I capture it. I see the world a particular way, and I take a picture of it. I see the world a particular way, and I just save that little, I take the business card off the wall, because no one was gonna go there anyway, and I take it, and I put it in my file. <laughs> Actually, it's funny, I reached into these pants, um, and in these pants that I put on this morning, there is a little piece of paper with two ideas, and you know what they're about? The next conference. <laughs> um, so, uh, my, what, my experience has been that buckets grow into chunks. Technical language, I'll explain it later. Um, that what happens is you've got a bucket and you've got this verse and all you know is you read this verse where Paul says the gospel has been preached to all creation. You're like, what? The gospel has been preached to all creation and you're just sitting there. Um, it's just sitting there and then Seven months later, you're reading a commentary on some other thing that you're working, some other actual pressing sermon you have to give, and the writer mentions what? That verse. Oh, no way. 
And so all of the sudden, this thing that struck you, but it struck you with a giant question mark, all of a sudden, you go to this bucket and you just write page whatever of whatever commentary mentions this verse and mentions two concepts. All of a sudden now, this bucket is starting to grow. It's no longer just a fragment. I at least have one thing I can do on it. Now, once again, I am not talking about instantaneous pastor.com, go in, pull that sermon off the shelf, and give it. I'm talking about something taking root in you, and you're living with it, and it's working on you. You can buy sermons off a shelf, which means they come in and they go out or you can live in the world in such a way that they come in, they go in and they sit there for a while and they do something to you. And so then when you actually get up, it's not coming from here, it's coming from here. And you know the difference. You know the difference when you hear it, you know the difference when you see it, and you know the difference when it's you. So imagine if you spent two minutes a week just capturing one thing. At the end of a year, you've got 50 things going on. And on a regular basis, what if one idea, fragment, insight, sentence, what, uh, one a week, what if once a week you spent five minutes and just read through all your buckets? Just open up each one. Five minutes, 10 minutes. How many of you, just reading it through, may see things you hadn't seen before? That's it, just, what else, what's going on here? What's going on here? Am I seeing anything new? Has this one moved? On a regular basis, I'll just read through this, like, oh yes, I forgot about that. And that is still totally meaningless to me. Oh, that, <laughs> or sometimes it'll be this. I'll go back and realize, Hey, wait, wait, I haven't done the Greek and Hebrew study on that. Oh, so now I'm not staring at a blank screen wondering what to do. That one has like given me homework. Find out what these words mean. Great, once again, what we don't want is a blank screen. What we don't want is a blank screen. Imagine if you sat down and you've got these things all humming and going. And for me, sometimes it's the computer, sometimes it's paper. Um, I am increasingly shifting among mediums depending on the nature of what this particular thing is. So some things for me are, um, I actually, I work in text edit. You know what text edit is? My brother's always like, you work in text edit. That is so lame. Um, I just like it because I don't like all the complicated stuff. Word for me is like all of a sudden out of nowhere, it punches me in the face by indenting things or it starts adding Roman numerals. And I'm like, what are you doing adding Roman numerals? I didn't ask for that. <laughs> so I just like, just get out of my way. You're, you're annoying. Um, so maybe for you it's three by five cards because maybe for you, if you're working in a, in, a, in a word processing document and you want to rearrange, then you're cutting and pasting. And sometimes if you're working on multiple pages, you can't see the whole thing. So you're having to cut from page one to page two into a page that you can't see at the moment and then back to a page that you can see again. Make, cor correct? Um, sometimes three by five cards mean you can see the whole thing and then instead of cut, paste, cut, paste, back and forth between pages you can't see, sometimes, uh, with a three by five cards, the Hebrew word is defined here, the story about my grandmother is here, those two questions are here, um, lyrics from that song that I'm gonna quote are here, um, the, reading the text is here, I can see the whole thing, and so then it's much easier to just, I think I start here, and then I think it goes here, and then I think it goes here, but that's, those two things are gonna be way, that's gonna, that's gonna be so heavy, I need to move that here and here. Correct? You can see it. So for you, I don't know how it works for you, but from my experience has been different content brings a different arrangement or a medium. Paper, notebook, legal pad. Um, if you are living this way, then when you receive or when you capture it, there is no pressure or time frame. The worst thing in the world is I have two days to come up with 
an illustration. So the way in which I am then searching for this content is deeply driven and dictated by the time pressure. There is always the chance then that I will settle for something that fills that space and loosely approximates what I'm looking for, but it isn't really what best serves the point I'm trying to make. Does that make sense? When you're under pressure, it becomes very easy to, well, I need some sort of story about hope. Oh, this is a story about hope. Yes, but it's a crap story about hope, okay? <laughs> okay, it's rubbish. And, it, it, and yes, it's about, or I need a story about, did it, okay, this is a story about somebody helping somebody, but my actual meaning was somebody in this particular place in life serving somebody in this particular place in life. That's actually the thing I'm really going for, but I found a, a story about somebody helping somebody, and so I settled, but it actually doesn't really fully serve the thing I'm trying to do here. Does that make sense? But you know what? It's coming, and I only have a couple days, so whatever. But when you are gathering things, there's always the chance at the end of two years, and you have 100 different fragments, and you're thinking, man, it'd be so great if I could, if I could bring to life this concept that is the thing behind the thing that Jesus is saying. Uh, it'd be so great if I could bring that to life and then you happen to be going through your buckets and you happen to be checking out some photos and you actually just, actually you go through that file just because you're like, I should probably, just, I should probably do that, that weekly or monthly discipline and you come across, oh, yes, that is this. By the way, whenever I meet somebody who tells me a story that embodies something that I think that's what we're about right there. If I meet somebody in our church or somebody on the street and they tell me a story that has got resurrection written all over it, if I meet somebody who tells me a story about something that happened between them and somebody else and I think, okay, that, that's, that's what it's all about, I always, you know what, could you do me a favor and write that story down and give it to me? Could, could, and could you just put your phone number at the bottom? I just, I just, I love these kinds of stories and these kinds of stories help other people in our church. And there might be some point where I get to share or you could get to share your story with everybody else. And I'd just love to be able to contact you. Could you, could you maybe do a favor and just write it down? You, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, we had our, we celebrated 10 years, the 10 year anniversary of our church in February. And I was working through what I wanted to say on the 10 year anniversary and a woman had sent me a letter two and a half years earlier that I had stuck in a file because I was like, this story, this is it. This story right here, this is it, this is why we do it. And so two and a half years after her letter, and I'd never met her, I just had this letter, I called her out of the blue, hey, is this so-and-so, so-and-so? Yeah, hey, this is, this is uh, my name is Rob, and I'm from Mar um, Mars Hill, and um, you sent me a letter two and a half years ago. Yeah, I did. W would you be willing to read it to our congregation for our 10-year anniversary? Yeah, I would, I would. And your husband, who you forgave and you reconciled and your marriage has been healed, would he be willing to stand next to you? Yeah, I think he would. Save that stuff, it's gold. Save it. D get a name and a license plate, write this down. Get a name and a license plate number. Get a phone number, get an email. Don't be sitting there and make a connection with this and this and this and realize that woman who told me that story about the abuse and being a single mom, she is the embodiment of this and I have no, and then you call and then you tell somebody in, in, the, in the church who has the database, yes, her name, I think it was Carol or Kathy and she had short dark hair. Oh, can, I, can you give me anything else? Mm, I, th she, I think she was short. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, okay, this thing that is going to make this teaching something, she's out there somewhere, and I, in the moment, God was in that place, and I, I was not aware of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are we tracking? Um, Oh, 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 and then this one. This one, this one truly can change everything. One of the things that helps me is we work really far out. If you're going to do a series, if right now you 
decided that you were going to do a series on, uh, let's just uh, pick something, Ezekiel, that's exactly what I was gonna say. Um, <laughs> let's say you decide you're gonna do a series on Ezekiel next January, February, and March. Let's say you read through Ezekiel and you realize it has so many chapters, you do a half hour of study and you realize, well, there seem to be 10 major movements. There seem to be a series of visions. You look for what I would call an organizing principle. How does this thing break down? Imagine if you, in Ezekiel, decided to do January, February, and March, and you just broke it down into its basic, however you looked for an organizing principle, either five chapters at a time, either things that happened to Ezekiel, either the six big ideas in Ezekiel, just pick some, whatever it is. Imagine right now if you made a bucket for each of those weeks. Would you, by the time you preached it, would those be better teachings? Yeah, yeah. Now that took us how much time? We're like what? Five minutes into our Ezekiel preparation and it's already gonna be way better. It's just intention. It's just intention. I'm gonna do this at some point. And so everything between now and then, by the time you get up, just the psychological power of standing up to give a message on something that you have been meditating on for six months. Imagine if right now you took two hours and memorized a several key paragraphs in Ezekiel that were gonna be the central paragraphs you were going to preach from. You did it right now. Imagine if you were then carrying Ezekiel around with you. What are we at? We're seriously, we're like at a half hour. We're like at an hour. And those entire three months will be radically transformed. It's just an issue of intention and then attention. Paying attention. You're paying attention. By the time you give that thing, and here's also the thing is oftentimes on Wednesday, if Sunday's coming, and you remember that plumber who said he was really good at making pipe sculptures, and you're like, I need a pipe sculpture or whatever. I don't know what that means, but it just sounded sweet at the moment. Um, <laughs> you're bringing in these people saying, could you do this in the next two days? But if you have looked out and realized Ezekiel does this thing about dry bones, come on, where do I get dry bones? You got six months to find bones. I'm gonna fill the stage with bones. I'm gonna find cow bones. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna fill the stage with real cow bones. Where do I buy cow bones? Well, I got six months to find that. There's a cow bone, cow bone dealer in your church, for sure. Somebody's like, I don't wanna get those. It's like drug dealers, I'll take care of it. No questions asked. Um, <laughs> But, but, but you got six months now. You're working through this thing. There's a valley of dry bones. What is that about? How can I do, what's, and as you begin, maybe you read a couple of commentaries, maybe you're working on this and you start to get a picture of what this could be and then, and then the creation of the event, well, you got time. You got time. You also can do these things like this. You sit down with the worship leader and for 20 minutes, for a half hour, for an hour, once again, hey, um, here's the series I'm thinking about. Check out some of this language that, that gets used. Here are some of the themes. Right, I haven't done much work on it, but here seem to be some of the big themes of Ezekiel. How many worship leaders would eat that stuff up? You're telling me where we're headed so I can be thinking about it too? What are we at? Like seriously, like a half an hour. This is not like 40 hours sequestered in a monastery somewhere. This is just basic, here's some stuff we're thinking about. So even among us, um, Sermon on the Mount, we're already, like, uh, just the other day, one of our pastors, Brad, was like, oh, hey, check this commentary out, handed me a commentary, just in passing, this one's great, beautiful. We've already got, like, a little thing going. Um, we've already got, like, a thing going. And this is not hours and hours and hours of technical meetings. This is just a bit of in intention and attention, series, some buckets grow. And then, um, if it isn't hot, Drop it. Sometimes you'd be like, I've, I've, I've done the Hebrew and Greek. I've read the commentaries in this passage. I got this bucket, but it hasn't gone anywhere. Fine, move on to something else. Move on to something else. Move on to something else. Drop it, thin and hot. Um, if you've gone down that road and you haven't found anything, then let's go. The worst thing is to sit there in front of a 
blank screen. And who knows, that bucket may go cold. I've, I don't know anymore what that Ephesians 1.10 is. I've done all the work I can figure out on that one. And you move on to the next bucket, you're working on something else, and you're just doing some basic, like I probably should read some commentaries, and once again, what happens? All of a sudden you realize, oh my word, there's a connection there. There you go. This um, is just a few thoughts I have on this. The all-important marinade. If you like put the sauce on five minutes before I pulled in your driveway and threw it on the grill, I'll know. <laughs> but if you took the ginger and the olive oil and a touch of lemon and some French sea salt and maybe a bit of soy sauce, and you worked that together the night before. And it took you 10 minutes, so it wasn't an issue of labor or time, it was an issue of intention and attention. And then you took that tilapia, you took that chicken, and you put it in that bag and you sealed it up and you put it in the refrigerator. And then when I taste that chicken, I will say to you, now that is a marinade. Certain things have to have time to soak. And this may be good chicken, and this may be good chicken, but it's totally different kinds of chicken. Radar, buckets, chunks, and the all-important marinade.